Hello, I'm Jorge Gestoso. Welcome to a new program. On today's show, close to 200 million people in poverty in 2019 in our Latin America, and the trend continued to grow. A region that underestimated inequality concludes the new report of ICLEC, the United Nations Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean. But what are the factors that contribute to that inequality? We ask our guest, Jorge Mahfoud, author and professor of international studies at the Jackson University in Florida. Jorge Mahfoud, a warm welcome to the program. Thank you for having me, Jorge. Jorge, of the many factors that contribute, which ones are the ones that you would say that uh, you are carrying the most? Last decades, uh, we may say, the, the neoliberal uh, agenda has contributed a lot because of uh, radical privatization of uh, education, healthcare, etc., etc. However, the, the, the huge um, differences, uh, social differences in Latin America has been a cultural, uh, structural, social characteristic of Latin Americans since uh, centuries ago because uh, uh, that huge differences um, were very functional uh, to serve uh, the, the export model uh, to which serve at, uh, in turn to the big um, superpowers, the, the global superpowers, uh, industrial countries in Europe or in the US that were allied with the ruling class in Latin America who needed cheap labor in their own country. So that was a, it is a long tradition. And when you have a long, long tradition of uh, anything, uh, even when you remove any causes, you will have the, the same effect uh, um, continuing by inertia. Um, but uh, however, uh, since the 60s and 70s, the, um, the reaction of neoliberalism, uh, not just in Latin America, but also in the US, you, you, you can see in, from the 80s how the gap between the very rich and the poor or the middle class began to widen, uh, to begin to grow, uh, uh, even uh, today is growing, um, that uh, which was called Latin Americanization of the, the American society. But uh, in Latin America, that's the, the major uh, reason to have uh, easy, uh, exploitable people uh, to serve certain economy, certain uh, ideology, uh, ideology that is the neoliberal. According to United Nations, our region, Latin America, is the one with the largest disparity in the world. Yes. And you are very much concerned also about education, private and public. Tell us about First of all, it, uh, we need to remember that uh, the, 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 most, the more unequal is a country or a region normally in, in, in the world, the more violent it is. So you have a lot of violence, not just structural violence, but also uh, street violence, common cr criminality. But uh, education helps uh, a lot. And we have, for example, uh, Uruguay, the case of Uruguay, Argentina, but also Uruguay was a clear uh, case uh, uh, because Uruguay was so far from the big uh, uh, superpowers we geographically geographically exactly and uh, also we didn't have uh, uh, or Uruguay didn't have uh, um, uh, in very important resources like gold uh, salitre um, any kind yeah, of lithium. lithium lithium now in, in Bolivia so, and uh, very low population meaning that uh, the rest of uh, superpower England UK the US neglected that region and because of that we were much able to invest in ourselves in particular in education so education became universal uh, mandatory in Uruguay at the end of the 19th century and uh, produced a lot of uh, change cultural and social and economic changes in, in the, the following uh, century and so that is there was free education free education exactly uh, uh, along with free health care etc and um, and uh, we have a very progressive uh, legislation in the in the first uh, decade of the 20th century uh, probably because of uh, education um, but uh, that was not the case on many other uh, places uh, long story short if we consider Chile right now we have uh, the, that the education in Chile is very similar to what we have here in the U.S. Uh, in the U.S., uh, both private and uh, public education are very expensive. In the case of Chile, it is uh, very expensive. Uh, students um, normally have to take care um, to take uh, loans from banks, and uh, it's a very good business for banks. But uh, normally, students just to graduate from in as engineer or whatever, they had to uh, take a, a loan of uh, fifty, seventy thousand dollars, or they have to to invest the following uh, twenty years in order just to cancel that debt. 
uh, and that produce, uh, uh, like in the U.S., uh, young people who have no time to stop and think about their own life, their the meaning of life, actually, the meaning of uh, their jobs, and just need to work in any uh, area just to cancel those mm -hmm. debt. And that produces a lot of uh, insatisfaction right now in Chile. That's what uh, we are seeing, that, that uh, conflict that many people say, well, Chile is uh, not a poor country. Uh, we made some uh, improvement in the numbers. Yes, but you are not looking at very specific uh, sector of the society, the young people who are uh, kind of becoming kind of a slave, a modern slave. Uh, because they just uh, they are indebted. And there's an issue of inequality regarding that structure of uh, private, very expensive uh, universities and also public universities or public schools. Is that the connections that the rich make among themselves that they're going to use and further in life to get the better jobs, the better deals, the better positions in government, it's, it's like a, like a vicious circle. Yeah, it's kind of a VIP club where the you know you have to pay a lot to have uh, more or less the same service in other that in other case. So uh, there are many re uh, studies and research on that in, in in England, in the U.S., in many other places of, of the world that clearly prove that uh, very expensive universities. Uh, don't teach uh, much better or, uh, than other universities, but uh, the, the real advantage of uh, that um, people who pay a lot is to uh, to connect, to connect, to build uh, a net of uh, influence among uh, wealthy people, which also create that uh, our aggravate that difference. In the case of Uruguay, if what was our case or my case, uh, I remember very clearly we were in the same public university, very very hard to to graduate, uh, much uh, serious in many aspects than some university in, here in the U.S. But we were together with the richest guy in, in the country or in the city, along with uh, the poorest in the same, working the same uh, table, uh, and the difference was uh, completely based on intellectual um, ability or skills or, or efforts. That was uh, very, very relevant to uh, balance a society, uh, the, this kind of uh, for free education in Uruguay that still exists, but uh, uh, neoliberalism hated all that and wanted to prioritize everything, including the education which was done in Chile. And you can compare the social uh, unrest in Chile to Uruguay. That is a completely different story. So I, I would say uh, there are many ways that you can invest in order to reduce inequality, but education is crucial, central. You have to be uh, to invest in dreams uh, in order to uh, uh, improve the, the future. And dreams are mostly the population are young people who are the dreamers, actually. You were mentioning uh, that you have a long relationship with Noam Chomsky, uh, that you share um, quite often conversations with him. And he was bringing to the table that, for example, one of the issues that the 1% could dominate the 99% has to do with the ownership of the mass media. Uh, mostly in Latin America, we know that the mass media uh, are in the hands of private citizens that most of the, most of the time belong of a, a huge corporate groups, uh, economic groups. And therefore, they perpetuate certain ideas to make sure that uh, you continue to vote for the 1%, even though that you represent 99%. And organizations like the uh, CIP, Inter-American Press Association, repeats the same rhetoric in order to justify the dominance. How important is the role of the private media, the mass media, in order to keep inequality? Yeah. You cannot put everything in the same bag, right? But uh, if you look at the pattern and traditionally, uh, Latin America has been, um, the, the press has been in, in the hands of the ruling class. And the ruling class have had a very important connection with the army and a very important connection with the charge, for example, before the, the, the the revolution of the 60s, but uh, traditionally. So the press always live, and particularly even today, uh, from the ads. And the ads uh, are paid by big uh, companies who have a special interest. It's not the people's interest, it's a special interest. And um, all that narrative are normally called uh, freedom of press. Of course, we are all all, all in favor of that, but the reality is like uh, free market. Uh, we are in favor of free market, but the reality is that uh, there is no free market when one 
groups, the powerful, impose uh, their rules over the rest. Rafael Correa, the former president of Ecuador, has a, a famous phrase. He said, since the freedom of expression has been uh, announced, the will of the owner of the printer is what is called the freedom of expression. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And uh, connecting to the previous uh, observation you made, um, that expresses a certain um, narrative, but also, uh, and just reflected on how is it possible, let's say, half percent of the 99 percent of the population, or half of the 99 percent of the population, vote uh, in favor of the one percent. And uh, the strategy is to, uh, to sell packages uh, including a certain economic strategy that benefit that 1% and the rest of uh, elements, uh, in that case the right wing is normally in the world very diverse in that case. So you can offer a menu of uh, religious uh, uh, elements, uh, on the social conservative elements that normally people are completely in favor of that. So they, they, buy, they buy the whole package and vote for that package. And that is uh, basically how, and the press play a very important role uh, selling that package. Another thing that worries you is militarism. Yes, that, that has been a, a long tradition in Latin America. The idea they sell, again, narrative is opposed to reality. The idea they sell that they defend the honor and the independence uh, of, of the country against foreign ideas, etc., was completely contradictory. Thanks to Latin American uh, militarism, I'm not saying exactly all militaries, but militarism, which is a kind of sect or, or, or ideology, thanks to that uh, I, um, mentality, it was possible that uh, foreign uh, uh, big companies were able to rule over Banana Republic, for example. They, they, ruled, uh, they passed the, their law, they wanted uh, ta tax exemption, etc., all protected by the military. Um, and the military very, were very careful uh, at uh, removing elected president when the elected president was not from one of their guys who were aligned with uh, that um, international interest. And that is what militarism play in Latin America. They really uh, fought a, a, a war uh, against any other country. Re it's very hard to find uh, one example. Peru and, and Chile in the 19th century, so on and so forth. And uh, well, the case of uh, Malvinas, that was, a, we can talk a lot about that, but it was kind of an exception. But the, their role, traditional role, was to oppress their own people and they receive a lot of money, for foreign money, to do that job. That is what they call militarism. At the beginning of this century, the inequality, for a moment, has been reduced. Yes. And now, lately, went up. Does it have to do with the new arrival of uh, neoliberal governments in the region? It's not a coincidence. Uh, the, the golden decade uh, from 2003-2004 to 2014 uh, was based on a lot of uh, social programs. In the case of Brazil, for example, Lula invested a lot of on po poor people and was able to took out from poverty 30 million people. Um, that many people say, well, you are giving away free money for poor people, they are lazy people, etc. Well, those new uh, middle class people began to work to go to schools, began to contribute to the economy and pay taxes. So th that was a very socially responsible, but also it was good for the economy. And don't please don't say that, well, there was a boom of the commodity. Latin America has had a, a many commodities price boom in, in the past, many, many. And uh, Latin America has never developed uh, because of uh, the most of the benefit went just to the tiny ruling class. That was the, and most of them sent the money to the, um, the foreign bankers. And that is what is happening today. The one percent in many countries are sen sending all that benefit, huge benefit to foreign can uh, foreign banks. Those banks who then uh, give the loan to. Uh, countries in crisis. Talking about another area that you were also concerned about inequality has to do with climate change or the lack of policies to care about climate change in the neoliberal governments in Latin America, so much so that Jair Bolsonaro has put on sale the Amazon jungle. And uh, as uh, Trump uh, normally does, he blames someone else for that. Uh, recently blamed uh, Leonardo DiCaprio <laughs> because of, uh, for the fire. That's ridiculous, uh, absurd. The, the, the Amazon has been, um, um, been destroyed for a long time, but uh, that destruction uh, accelerated. 
uh, speed up, uh, accelerate uh, in the last uh, two uh, years that because of uh, business-oriented policies. And that creates inequality. For example, yeah. all the indigenous population in the areas are being displaced yeah. in many orders that continues to create the big rift between the yeah. rich and, and the poor. And it's very also very important to understand that inequality is not just something good and uh, convenient. It's, it's also a part of uh, uh, justice. The idea of the trickle-down theory that uh, the rich benefit the poor is uh, fiction. Uh, the, we, we were able, as humankind, to make a, a, a progress, not just because of a given model in, in, in a certain moment, but uh, we have been accumulating knowledge, technical, scientist knowledge, and social knowledge since centuries ago. The, the algebra, the algorithm, were invented by Arabs in, in 1,000 years ago, so on and so forth. Uh, to, not to mention the, the, the scientific revolution in Europe in the, in the 16th century. So there was no capitalism at, at that moment. So we are the result of a long history. The social uh, uh, fights and uh, resistance of many groups, like the social movement in the, U in the US, so on and so forth, uh, have, uh, gave us certain um, uh, freedom <laughs> No army gave us any freedom but those who resisted power. And so the, the reality is that the, 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 those below are responsible as workers, consumers, uh, journalists, salaries, journalism, professors, whatever, they, they are not capitalists. The NASA was not developed by capitalists, by uh, the government, so on and so forth. So all that um, internet, so on and so forth, mm -hmm. all that technology, all that uh, social progress, human progress is the result of a long, long history. It's not uh, something that uh, graciously the 1% uh, donates to the rest of the human humanity. That's what the narrative said. Uh, the coup d'etat in Bolivia, and also we have seen the right wing uh, winning the elections in Uruguay. What will be those two trends could make inequality continue to grow? In the, in the case of Uruguay, as normally Uruguayans uh, uh, do, is to uh, make um, changes to the left, to the right, mo in a moderate way. In the case of uh, Bolivia, I feel that it's going to be a much uh, um, uh, violent uh, uh, option. Uh, that that is has been the Bolivian uh, tradition, much violent than uh, the Uruguayan case. And uh, well, the, what we can expect is the, any um, delegitimized um, government coming to certain election, if we have selection, probably, um, they, they, they are not going to be real, free, democratic election as Bolivia had for the first time with the integration, inclusion of uh, the 60 or more percent of uh, indigenous people of that country. The majority of the country has traditionally been uh, uh, marginalized and uh, with a, a huge uh, racist culture in Bolivia, very deep racist culture that's very hard to, uh, to, to eliminate. And uh, we, we, in that aspect, we, can, we may have election like we had uh, in Honduras when the, uh, Manuel Zelaya was out uh, by a military coup and put nobody care right now about that, but uh, the, normally the, the right uh, know how to do things. And what are the things that concern you the most about this enormous inequality gap? That, uh, as I said uh, before, uh, we, we are on two important uh, timing bomb. Uh, the one is the ecological, the, the, pro the ecological problem, and the, the second one is the huge disparity or inequality in our societies. I'm not just talking about uh, poor, very poor, uh, but also just uh, uh, inequality considering middle and the tiny uh, ruling class, uh, financial class. Uh, so uh, my concern is that in the long term, not right now in the short term, but in the long run, that uh, we uh, cross uh, no, no return point and uh, will face a uh, um, very serious or uh, catastrophic uh, uh, crisis. We consider that in, uh, uh, 100 years ago we were uh, suffering a huge inequality and that uh, led to um, the cr crash of 1929 that led to the many um, uh, European um, fascists and then the war. Who knows? Uh, but nothing very optimistic uh, can be expected from that. Jorge Marfut, thanks very much for joining us. Uh, my pleasure. Thank you very much.